CLI on a cross-platform IDE for C and C++. Download now. My name is Dominic, and I'm presenting. I've uh, been in game development for like the last 12 years or so. And this talk is about some mistakes made uh, during uh, in da handling data uh, during game development. Uh, so it's uh, quite just a short overview of a bunch of issues that I've uh, encountered, but not a deep dive into any specific one. Um, reference. So the first sort of mistake that I've seen is uh, not including a uh, version number in files or enough version numbers in files. Uh, why is this a problem? Uh, they, you know, one of the things is that change is one of the only consistent things in game development. Both the data that you store and the format that you store it in changes over the course of a single game's development. And including a version field will make it much easier to manage the data if at least to give a, a good error message saying uh, the thing that you're trying to load is completely out of date. Um, and it also helps in handling upgrades of, um, of data to newer formats. So you can load an older format and when, when you save it, it automatically upgrades it to the latest version. So the best way to fix this is obviously you have a top level uh, file version in the header and a lot of engines like Unreal Engine already do that. And they store the sort of this serialization version in it. Uh, the other place you also need it is whenever you uh, do any custom serialization. So you have like an array of plain old data or of like trivial types or structures as it usually is. And you want to serialize them for efficiency sake. In that case, uh, you can either bump up the top level version number or you can uh, have another alternative uh, dedicated version number just for that field. Um, and yeah, uh, and also the key thing here is in you want to actually have version numbers in text files as well, because just because you have like a JSON file and you can uh, have different fields and you can kind of mi mix and match them, it really simplifies the loading scheme to actually know which version you're trying to load and then you know all of the uh, fields that should be there. The next sort of mistake that I've seen is not using version control correctly. And what I mean by that is uh, there's sort of two key ways in which version control is misused. The first one is storing, trying to store everything in version control. So this includes like all of the source assets from uh, all of the human created source assets, but also all the compiled and generated assets. And this leads to the sort of famous example of everybody on the team needing four terabyte plus NVMe drives just to be able to have one or two checkouts of the game. Um, so the other, the other sort of thing is, well, the other problem that comes with that is that the generated data, the data that's built from the sort of human edited data can often be out of date, especially if it has multiple dependencies on the human generated data. So like you have a, a material and you have multiple textures and then you're building something from that it's a combination, so when someone changes one, someone changes another, you might end up any sort of combination of the generated file. The other sort of thing is, uh, problem how it's misused is, you sort of, don't, you sort of work around the, the version control system, so you don't integrate it with it directly. A sort of a good example of that is, in game development, Perforce is often like the, um, sort of the main version control system that's used, and it, by default marks files on your local workspace as read only. And that's so you can kind of know that if you need to change it or not. So you need to check it out first, then work on it, then check it in. And so I've worked in systems where you've, the system just removes the read only flag and saves the file whenever it's requested to. And in that case, you just get a whole lot of files changed through some innocuous process. And either the person has a lot of change which they don't know what happened or you just data gets out of sync. So how to use it better? Uh, my recommendation is to only store the source files in version control. This is the source code, the scripts, any text data, but it also includes things that are human created like textures or Photoshop files or uh, model files from Maya or other content creation tools. 
everything else that's generated from that should actually be stored in some external cache and downloaded on demand. And that means you don't need as much space to check out the game from version control. Um, and obviously don't silently just remove the read-only flag. Next sort of big uh, mistake is using implicit dependencies. And so implicit dependencies, the short way is they're uh, dependencies which require knowledge that's embedded in the code to resolve. So two examples up there, uh, the first one is where you change the file name or the file extension or even the paths in some way to get from one file to its dependency. Um, and the other one is where you have, where you explicitly load files from code, but you only store them as like string literals or something like that. Uh, the issues they cause is, you know, you have to recreate this information if you write an external tool or program which wants to handle things with this. The main benefit to having explicit dependencies, which is sort of the inverse, inverse of this, is you get to be able to build, like each file knows about what it depends on. And from that, you can build a whole entire graph of all of the files that actually get used by your game, um, which in the end allows you to actually create a smaller uh, distributable, like a smaller uh, build on, on Blu-ray disc or download now. And it also um, sort of enables smaller patches and it also allows uh, or prevents you from leaking information that you may not want to leak. So for example, uh, upcoming DLCs or expansion packs, the people might be working in the actual version control, putting code in that's meant to be distributed for the future, but it could just get leaked by accident early. So the way to make it explicit, just make it explicit store it in the actual file, in the binary. But a key point here is use a consistent format for storing that data. So you can have a single uh, bit of code, even in another programming language or another uh, system, which can load it, parse it, and create this tree where you don't need to use the game code. Um, you can alternatively use a sidecar file for this metadata, but because it's a separate file, it can fall out of date, out of sync with what it's, uh, the metadata that it's storing. Um, as for the code example, the, the way to do it is to have a dedicated type, which uh, wraps the string literal or the resource name or path or whatever you use to identify it. And you can either have it self-register at runtime, so you have it as a static constant in at file scope and in the constructor it registers with some global system or alternatively you can write a parser to go through and collect all these things through the source code the next sort of uh, mistake is having manual manually edited file lists um, the main problem with this is they just the tribal knowledge and they get out of date usually if you have uh, so something that needs to be added to a list, you know, you won't add it the first time, but the second time you'll know about it and you'll add it. A bigger problem is when you, something changes or the file gets deleted or something like that and you need to remove it from that list and often it doesn't happen and you just end up with uh, log messages spamming that something couldn't be loaded or something's in the wrong format. Um, so, and the worst case is, stale entries in those files can get shipped with the final game. So fix it, just automate management of these things. Either get the editor to add this you know, new file in when it needs to be and remove it when it doesn't, or if you don't actually need to, generate these lists automatically uh, at sort of data build time. So when you compile all the data for the game, you can generate these lists uh, using some sort of automated system. Uh, next sort of mistake I've seen, which is actually cost development time, is trying to store too many things in a single file. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's trying to store related components, but that can be still individually edited. So an example like there is an animation graph, which is the sort of like a state diagram of transitions between different animated components and the actual animations in the same file. 
And this creates an issue because one person might want to edit the graph by itself and then many other people may want to edit the anima individual animations within that. And this generally creates a bottleneck towards the end of a project when you need people to work quickly because they can't, uh, they're, they're just waiting, they're queuing for access to the file in version control. So the simple fix is just to split it up that file into multiple files. Sometimes it's easier said than done. Uh, the reason you usually create these bigger files is to optimize loading or performance. So that also affects iteration time. And the key point here, here is you may not actually need to recreate the file after you've split it up because you can just probably even leave it for like the packager at the end of the process, the one that builds like those really big files for distribution to handle that for you, not something that you need during development. And so we come to like the last sort of mistake that I've seen and that's making non-deterministic files. And so what is non-determinism? That's when you just save the file, you may not make any content changes, but it ends up being having uh, like differences in the binary, in the actual data that you store on disk. So the issue here is that checksums within the file or checksums of the file or hashes of the file will change, whereas the actual logical content has not changed. So if you, uh, even in text files, if you diff these things, you end up uh, seeing all of these sort of things change, but they might not actually be changed. Uh, this hinders things like reproducible builds or storing those files in content caches, which is important for being able to reduce size, uh, size of those caches. And uh, it also makes, in the, in the end, it also makes patches much larger. Because if you haven't changed the logical content, but the actual bytes on disk have changed, a lot of systems just do a naive diff and you end up distributing all of the game's data again, just rearranged slightly. And this actually applies to both uh, binary and text files, as you will see. There's like three, point, three ways that you can kind of uh, create these issues. And the first one is like ser serializing uninitialized memory to disk. This often happens when you have a, a structure with padding in it and some system initializes it but doesn't clear it. So that random bit of data will get serialized to disk. Uh, the simplest fix is to just pack the elements more tightly so you don't have padding when you're writing data to disk or clear the memory. Um, are we going on time? 10, okay. So an example that we had before is this can also happen in third party code. So a long time ago, we had this issue with uh, DirectX provided library where we were serializing a structure that we got from it. And it actually had random bits of uh, data in some of the padding. And so you'd, every time you'd save it, it'd be something different. Uh, what we ended up having to do is literally hook into the uh, Windows DLL for memory allocation and set a flag that would actually clear the memory. You had to do that at the start and then on shutdown had to uh, remove it so it would have a clean shutdown. Um, so it is possible to do in third party code, just a little bit harder. The next sort of thing is serializing what I call dynamic metadata. And this is things like the current date, the current time. It may be the uh, username of the person on the computer or the computer name and uh, various other sort of dynamic things like that. Um, often they're included in file formats, but I don't believe they're necessary. And because they change every time you save it, if you just keep, you know, if you by reflex keep spamming control S to like save all the time, you can end up with different files for no reason. So the simplest fixes are just remove these fields if they exist. If, if it's necessary and part of like, an older data format, just zero them out or assign them to some invalid value. Um, or if you still need these, these bits of information, store them in an adjacent metadata file. So you can, uh, and that's probably more helpful for content that's generated by, uh, by a build system. Okay. Then the last sort of one, and this uh, applies 
heavily to text files is storing or serializing lists in some sort of indeterminate or random order. And it's probably one of the simpler mistakes to make because you just, you know, saves a, a list that you have in, a, in an object to, to disk, to the file. But if it's, you haven't sorted it before, the order can be completely random. And when you do a diff, even in a text file, you see that oh, everything's changed, but in reality, nothing hasn't. So it makes it really difficult to see what's been inserted or removed. So ideally, sort all arrays and uh, containers before writing them to the file. Um, some trick with this is in case you don't know or some elements don't have a defined sort order, one common uh, trick I found is to, when loading them, you or, uh, assign each one an index of what they were loaded with. So at worst, if there's any conflicts, if you've done merging or something, you can at least have this last fallback value to fall back to, to, determ to have a determined order which you serialize. And I believe that's it. Thank you.